So whether you're a new time fan to the series or whether you kind of want a bit of a refresher, this video is meant to be a very quick overview, I think, of everything I think you should know before you start watching the Fallout TV show. Um, by the time I actually released this, this has been way beyond actual, actual use. Um, I think kind of the fact they poured forward the kind of the release date has been a bit of a kick in the nuts, in my opinion, <laughs> in terms of content creation and making sure that I've got things ready in time. Um, but nonetheless, see this as I said, a guide to everything you, I think you should know before watching the Fallout TV show, in which I'll be covering the factions, where we're at in terms of the timeline, the areas that we're exploring, creatures, and also some of the tech. And a little side little spin-off thing, we'll be talking about ghouls as well, so very quick note. So this will be a very quick overview, this won't be anything too detailed. I will be doing bigger videos separately, probably beyond the show's release, talking about these individual topics. But see, this is kind of a light touch review for those who are very new to the series, um, or those who are kind of not seen, be kind of touched up on the law for a little while. See, this is a refresher course for yourself. So let's start off with, with where are we at? So essentially this is kind of the post-apocalyptic kind of Great Wars happens. The Great Wars are a very quick summary. But essentially a heavy two-hour nuclear exchange between kind of the West and kind of um, China and the East kind of going at it after kind of a long stretch of multiple wars. It's summed up in the Resource Wars as the name. And essentially the combination of that was a two-hour conflict in which they both threw mis uh, missiles and nukes at each other. Um, who fired first is the, the idea is that it's relevant. So... That's where we're at. So currently the TV show is set in the year 2296. So the stuff happened in the year 2077. So as a, as a point, we're talking uh, about 220 years after the Great War happened. So we, we're well beyond that now. Um, and obviously, in terms of where we are, we're currently on the West Coast. The last time we've seen the West Coast in the Fallout franchise was approximately about 15 years prior in Fallout New Vegas. So it's been a little while since we've seen the West Coast and seen exactly where we're at. Um, the last couple of games, Fallout 76 and Fallout 4, took place on the East on the East Coast. So obviously, the kind of what happens there is not necessarily relevant. But Fallout 4 does take place um, quite the most recently in terms of the fact that it was only um, about 10 years prior. So you do have that as a point of reference. Probably, I'd argue the most important part of this kind of video is talking about the factions, about the sort of players are in play in this get in this TV show. So. Based on obviously what we kind of see in the trailers, what we currently know, we know the main players are probably going to be the Brotherhood of Steel, the, um, the NCR, New California Republic, and obviously I'm going to mention Voltec as a faction, even though they're technically not. Um, they are just a general entity. So to start off with, the Brotherhood of Steel, as it's a very quick um, fire tour, the Brotherhood of Steel are essentially were founded just before the Great War. In a kind of quasi-religious way, they see themselves as protecting humanity from themselves. So in their, their power armor, which they basically walk around in with a kind of the fusion cores in the back as knights of old, they all go around and making sure that humanity is saved from themselves by removing dangerous technology that they feel like mankind can't be trusted with, and that the nuclear exchange was essentially the culmination of that problem, that mankind having access to technology that they can't um, grasp properly simply leads to devastation and apocalypse. So obviously the conclusions are... A bit crazy, but it doesn't come from completely fruitless thinking. Um, they do have the kind of the, the goodness of humanity, but they also carry with them an arrogance that they know best. Um, and they, in some of the games, you have seen them being isolationist, cruel, and at times flat out violent towards outsiders who they feel like getting in the way of what they need to be doing. So there are different um, sects or different sections of the um, Brother of Steel. Um, however, some of them do kind of vary in their approaches. Some are more kind of humanity based. Some are very kind of dogmatic. It, it just comes with the region realistically. But we do find on the whole East Coast tends to be a little more friendly than West Coast. So the fact we're seeing the West Coast means we're going to have quite a lot of fun with likely more kind of dedicated dogmatic um, individuals from the Brotherhood of Steel compared to those that some individuals might know from the Fallout 3 and Fallout 4 games. On the other hand, we have the New California Republic. So the New California Republic um, ar arose themselves from a vault. Um, and from that vault also left with them groups that split off to be um, rival groups of raiders, essentially. I won't get, again, I won't get into much of who they are. But essentially, from the very get-go, they were faced with constant threats, especially from a group known as the Khans. And from very early interactions with kind of the um, player characters in the earlier games, uh, we essentially see that they go from being a small community of Shady Sands to being quite a, a powerful group by the time of Fallout New Vegas in the year 2281, which is approximately just over 15 years before the, the Fallout TV show takes place. Um, their expansionist views and kind of their way of kind of pushing forward to kind of re-establish democracy, kind of setting up their own republic, trying to be um, essentially the America of old, in a sense, um, has kind of led them to have clashes with the Brotherhood of Steel, who see their expansionism um, and kind of their, in their mind, their lack of care towards technology. They, it's a natural friction between the groups. And this has culminated 
um, a few decades prior to this, where a, another group called the Enclave, again, I won't go to who they are, but essentially they're a more fascist um, view of kind of reclaim America, um, exterminating anyone who stands in their way. Um, and after the fall of the Enclave, who were vastly more technologically superior to everyone else, when they fell, the Brotherhood of Steel and the NCR were left to the pa- a power and a technology void, where such a big rival group that they both joined up against, without them being there, they turned on each other. Um, so all these frictions that fell away in the conf- joint conflict immediately arose and kick-started a, quite a bloody war between the groups. Um, and we find out by the time of Fortnite Vegas that actually, despite being technologically outdone, the NCR with their extremely vast numbers in comparison, I obviously I don't want to throw to you a figure that I, um, off the top of my head, but we're talking 10 to 1, it's a ridiculous ratio. Um, the Bro- Brotherhood of Steel were quite easily smashed in time because they couldn't replace the people they lost since they had very highly technical people or very kind of highly qualified senior knights and paladins. But if, when they lost them to the conflict, they couldn't replace people to the sort of degree that the NCR could, which essentially meant that the Brothers of Steel were left kind of squashed, defeated, pushed their bunkers largely in retreat by the time of New Vegas. And um, we only find by Fallout 4, kind of a, a matter of years later, that they're only struggling to make some form of resurgence. However, obviously I'll get into um, this in probably future videos, or probably as we can actually review the show itself, but I think we can quite clearly see from the trailer that despite I'm saying kind of the, the doom and gloom for the Brothers of Steel, it seems they've definitely had a comeback of some kind, um, considering the fact that they now have air superiority with their vertibirds or their their, their flying crafts that they, eventually, they pretty much have in the trailer. Um, so it's pretty clear that they've assumed dominance once again in the region. So the show might give us a bit more transparency to how this happened, um, but long story short, it seems like the Brotherhood of Steel's age of being kind of squashed into their bunkers is long gone. And whatever they've done seems to basically led them to being the dominant force on the West Coast again. And the NCR, despite seeming having kind of superiority amongst the region, seem to be themselves in a bunk period retreat based on what we've seen. Um, so it'll be quite interesting to see how it kind of pans out in the actual show about who really is in control of the West now. So Voltec were a pre-organisation that essentially said to the American government, look, nuclear, nuclear war's coming, we all know this. Let us set up bunkers, or special vaults as they called them, to keep safe humanity. Um, these vaults were ridiculously expensive and usually cost billions beyond their actual price. Um, but nonetheless, America put forward the funds to produce more of them and they produced several hundred across America. Now, what this means is, is that less than about zero... 1% of the population were saved in any capacity. And these vaults, even beyond that, were known to have experiments within them to test humanity that remained. So they weren't completely meant to keep people safe, they were also meant to test them. So whether that's being kind of more creepy vaults, such as a thousand men and one woman, or the reverse, or whether we're talking about a man in Vault 77 who's left with just a box of puppets to see if he'd go insane, there's a bunch of crazy tests that I can do loads of videos on. But long story short, um, the population generally didn't fare very well in the vaults. It proved a bit better off their left outside to be um, bombed. Um, however, nonetheless, they were somewhat safe in the vaults. Some of these vaults weren't necessarily left to um, completely turn everyone sane or lead them to die. Some of them were known as control vaults. So they're essentially vaults that were just meant to compare against the other population experiments. They weren't meant to have any dangerous or horrible things happen to them at all. There are also some that, despite being experiments, were not necessarily the worst. Um, for example, um, Vault 101, we find in Vault 3, was actually originally had an experiment to see how long an overseer could assume control as long as possible. Um, but obviously we know that it was not necessarily the worst vault in the world. It just eventually fell apart when people did find out that the outside world was accessible and they could leave at any time. But nonetheless, the vault dwellers within these vaults typically want to stay there. Um, those who might be aware of the surface, they generally want to avoid it, especially a couple of hundred years um, away and they've been in the vault such a long time. They would likely stick in the vault as much as possible because you, down, down in the vaults, they have everything they can realistically need and they are not those, those who have not explored to the surface aren't aware of the dangers up there. So in their minds, it's not really worth the risk. So you, the vault dwellers, especially those we see in the show, would likely have just stayed there for most of the time. Um, and that's why in the trailer, we see the woman being like, essentially like, holy shit, you guys are alive. You guys actually exist. Because people on the surface wouldn't have seen a new vault dweller in decades and would assume they'd either been all been wiped out just from being in their vaults for so long or that all the ones that could leave have left already. Now we're mainly, I'll quickly cover the area that we're in. So West Coast and East Coast, I'm going to quickly just summarise what it is we're kind of looking at. So the West Coast, in terms of what they've gone through this region, is in Fallout 1 there's a conflict between mutant known as the Master who led a group of super mutants who are these heavily radiated Shrek looking people essentially declare war on the wasteland and to take all the people that they could, especially vault dwellers, to be pulled back to his uh, military base where he was, had this 
It's this goo called the Force Evolutionary Virus, and his plan was to convert everyone to his super mutants, and that he'd make the perfect race. Um, however, he'd whatever means, he either kills himself or he is killed. In terms of Fallout 2, essentially what the case is, is that this grandson of the Vault Dweller from the first game, so the Fallout 1's protagonist was known as the Vault Dweller, in Fallout 2, the Chosen One, essentially assumes the kind of the role of saving his tribe and his people from the Enclave, who have kidnapped and taken his people um, the Enclave being, as I previously mentioned, a, a, and again, a power armor clad um, fascist pre-war group that are now assuming, trying to assume control of the US and essentially just saying, we are the supreme pure humans. Anyone else on the wasteland is worth exterminating. Um, and anyone they kidnap is usually for experiments to try and test the, um, different things on. Um, ironically, they do have a mutant amongst their ranks called Frank Horrigan, but I'll go into him in another video. Um, so that's, for, that's Fallout 2. Um, and obviously he, that ended with the Enclave being royally smashed and defeated, even their mutant Frank Horrigan. Um, and then in terms of the next West Coast game we have is Fallout New Vegas. So Fallout New Vegas takes place in Nevada and there's a large conflict between the NCR, No California Republic, and the Legion, which is a large kind of um, slavery-driven um, army that revolved around a man called um, Caesar, who sees himself as the son of Mars, um, who is the kind of Roman war god. And their idea is that, obviously, they will assimilate and grow and take over kind of tribes. They see themselves as kind of a, a better over the raiders that kind of played the region. And that the best way to the wasteland is through dominance and kind of crushing things with an iron fist. Um, and obviously, that's the last time we really see of kind of either faction in the series is their kind of large conflict in Fallen Vegas to the point where we're still not sure who won the conflict. Um, I think some theories could be suggested that the NCR potentially lost based on how they they seem quite crushed and defeated in the trailers. But obviously, that's just my theories at this point. Now, in terms of the creatures, so, so there's one I actually have no idea what it is. There's one leaping out the pond. I have no idea what that is, to be honest. Um, I could potentially theorize as we've seen some, but I, I hesitate to throw a guess out, to be honest. I'm more interested just to find out. However, there's three main ones. So one is a Deathclaw. So the Deathclaw itself is a, a genetically engineered creature that was developed before the war by the US. And the idea was it was to be used in kind of close quarter combat situations where essentially they mark a target and it goes to shreds it and, and instead of putting humans at risk. Um, it was largely mythical, kind of the earlier um, games, because obviously they weren't very widespread. However, towards the later games, they've because they can reproduce fairly quickly, they've largely, I wouldn't say taken over, but this apex predator is essentially everywhere. So there's no avoiding them anymore. They're a very common occurrence, and I expect to see them in the Fallout TV show. Even though we don't exactly see them in the trailer, I have no doubt we'll see them in the um, show at some point. Now, the other one is known as a Yaogwai. So a Yaogwai is a bear that has been mutated. That is it. And um, they've mutated to be extremely large. Um, some have mutated to be even slightly larger, but typically on the whole, they're just mutated bears. There's not a lot, lot else to them to be other than that. Now, the last one is the most interesting one, which is a ghoul. So, obviously, the ghoul is the main one of the main title characters or one of the characters we keep seeing in the promotional art. Now, what is a ghoul? So, in the following games, a ghoul is essentially a person who went through extreme radiation either quickly or suddenly um or sometimes even slowly it, there's no exact science to it but through con constant exposure or even instantaneous exposure to radiation a person almost undergoes a drastic evolutionary change to themselves so rather than essentially just mutating away and dying the person's own body essentially goes into like a, an extreme survival mode where it sacrifices and loses kind of soft tissue in order to maintain itself as a very malnourished and almost gaunt looking person who loses, misses things like noses, sometimes lips, and in exchange they can actually then survive from the radiation itself. So they're almost an extreme mutation of a person who have gone through extreme radiation and despite the fact that they, they should have died, they actually survive as a kind of, a, as I say, as a ghoul. And they're largely shunned, some seeing them as zombies because they can go feral in time. If a ghoul is left too long, um, and basically without people or they go sometimes get too radiated they become feral where they become essentially like a zombie and they screech and they run at you as can be found in the games Fallout 3 which is honestly one of the most terrifying things in my childhood so i'm not going to relive really that again finally the, the final section is tech so one of the big things in the Fallout universe is that the pre the kind of the timeline of the, the world took a very different detour where transistors weren't available as early on in our timeline it only came into play decades later so essentially you get this weird sci-fi futuristic bulky weird sci-fi stuff going on so one of the big things you'll see in the Fallout TV show is something called a Pip-Boy which the main character is already wearing and is all, all vault dwellers so Pip-Boy known as a personal information processor 
boy. It's a small, um, well, I wouldn't say small, but it's a, for, for them, it's a small computer on your wrist or a smartwatch, if we're going to kind of cheapen it down to that. And it can be used by the individual, especially those who in the vaults, to kind of keep up on their rad levels, see how their biology is doing, if their limbs are all good, and um, if they can, if what the map's looking like. In game, it's used as much for inventory management, track teleport is in your fast travel, but obviously in the actual lore, it's essentially a be-all device where you can keep an eye on your health, rads, and things like that. Um, and obviously, we'll be seeing this as kind of a key point in the show where. Obviously, this is a vault dweller getting up onto the surface, so things like measuring your rads, keeping on how your health is doing, will be very integral for her, so she kind of tra transits from being inside the vault into having to survive onto the wasteland itself. Very, very quickly move on to the last bit, which is, what is power armour? So you see, obviously, in the trailer, the kind of the big guys in armour walking around. What is that? So power armour is essentially a pre-war invention, and the whole idea was this was meant to be kind of the way to beat the, the Chinese, especially in conflicts known as the Sino-American War, where China and America before the Great War went at each other, um, and they needed a technological edge because China were really going at it, especially their stealth tech. The power armour was the change to that. So starting with the T-45 um, power armour, um, which was... Fusion core straight in the back. It could filter um, water through systems so you could wee in it and drink it. There you go, you're welcome for that. And in time, this then evolved into the T51 Power Armor series, which was really the turning point for the war and allowed them to really encroach and break into um, Chinese territory, especially onto the homeland itself. Now, now the Power Armor we see in the Fallout TV show so far from the trailers is the T60 Power Armor series. The so T60 Power Armor series is something you saw kind of in Fallout 4 for the first time. However, we, we, we believe essentially it was the kind of the top, just before kind of the Great War really kicked off, it saw kind of some in homeland internal use. The T60 Armor is, to be fair, it's probably the top of the line, probably the, the, probably the top um, release Power Armor. There are obviously some, the X01 is also pretty powerful, but that wasn't fully released, it's still in prototype form. So the, the T60 is the top of the line of kind of the fully released power armor series. And essentially, like kind of the other power armor, it can it very easily deflects ballistic damage, as you saw in the trailer. Um, it can also disperse and kind of throw off um, a lot of laser fire, um, as well as plasma damage. And essentially using, as with the other power armors, having a, a fusion power core on the back, which is a, a small nuclear fusion device plugged into the back, a soldier can last for a long time and take on a lot of damage. Um, especially as they're kind of traversing the waste and having to deal with threats, as I previously mentioned, such as the Yagwai, the Death Claws, and even Feral Ghouls, um, which obviously all goes to a head and shows that the NCR were particularly powerful to take on a lot of these people wearing this power armor, considering the fact that the power armor itself is very powerful stuff. Now, I've, I think I've really danced around the topic and really kind of um, said a lot for what's meant to be a quick summary, but I hope this kind of gives you a general overview in about 20 minutes about what to expect in terms of kind of the general quick lore, the factions, the tech, what ghouls are, what creatures are there, what previous games have shown us, and I think hopefully this ultimately gives you a sort of idea of what to expect in the TV show. So if you love kind of Americanized, post-apocalyptic, kind of crazy tech that's really um, sci-fi, as well as weird mutants and ghouls with a big faction conflict, um, while someone's just trying to go out, into the vault, uh, out of the vault for the first time onto a post-apocalyptic world, following 200 years in a vault, obviously not them themselves, but their fellow vault dwellers, then welcome to the Vault TV show, and I hope you enjoy as much as I'm hoping I will.